Ivan Pavlenko from Family to Family, Chapter 3, Part 7.3, To Get Higher Education, read by Natalia Buzova. The Nizhyn Pedagogical Institute is one of the oldest in Ukraine. It was opened in 1820 in the former palace of Prince Bezborodka, a favorite of Catherine II. The photo of the 1950s. It must be said that the Bezborodkos came from the Ukrainian Cossack chieftainship. They built 32 churches in their ancestral Nizhen, one at the best of each son who continued their family. It's true, there are about a dozen of them left. The communists simply destroyed the rest. The palace itself is a three is three storied, built in the style of classicism according to the drawings of the architect Raska, who is also the author of the Contractola Square project in Kyiv. The main body is white, like a swan drowning in luxurious greenery. Around it is a large botanical garden and a park <clears throat> with alleys and a water circuit on the rear sides. Writers Mikola Ohol and Yohan Hrebinka started at the Nizhyn Institute, and in the Soviet period, Yuri Zbanatsky, Oleksa Yushchenko, Yohan Hutzelov. There were five faculties, philological, historical, physical, and mathematical, natural sciences, and foreign languages. I started at the Russian department, since for some reason there was no recruitment for Ukrainian that year. Obviously, it was one of the manifestations of the planned Russification of the Ukrainian school. There were two groups, 25 students each. There were two other students of my age in our group. A legless, one front-line soldier, Ivan Ilyich Chirvyakov, and former librarian of the institute. The rest were 10, 12 years younger. Among them, there were two Jewish women from Kyiv, Annette Drapkina and Alla Malkina. Both were excellent students. Somehow I asked Annette why she had not taken entrance exams in the capital, but in Nizhyn, and had the answer. Now there is an anti-Semitic epidemic in Kyiv, and I could be failed at the exams. Yvhen also a future writer, started in our group and lived in the same group room with me. Ivan Pavlenko is in the center of the photo. Ivan, Ivan Hupola is the first in the first row on the right. This is the second year of the philological faculty in 1957. There were also three students in our group about whom it was said that they entered through good connections. One of them was the son of the nationally known hero of socialist labor, deputy of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, handsome and thoroughbred. The whole physique and features of the face were the Hellenic type. Tall, slender, black wavy hair on the head, cheerful eyes with playful lights, and above them black eyebrows in arcs. The high forehead, light and convex stood out in particular. It seemed that in that head there was mine, which two people were laying and the set was trembling. The girls just lowered their wings, so they ran after him saying, Vitalka, Vitalka. One, then another friend invited him to her birthday. Vitalka began to be late for classes due to a hangover and then to skip them. Rumors spread that he had already been picked up by the city's beauties. Meanwhile, the examination period came. Vitalka failed on the very first exam. I was the leader of the group. The girls ran up to me and said, you need to ask the teacher to accept Vitalka again because he had had a difficult exam task. I didn't like to ask for fools and idlers, especially for drunkards and truants, but I went to the teacher and from on behalf of the group asked to accept him once again. He answered, let him take the other exam and then I will accept. Vitalka went to take the second exam and got a two again, and then he suddenly disappeared. Later we learned that his father had come and helped Vitalka to take a one year academic leave allegedly due to health. 
and a year later he appeared as a first year student of the Faculty of Natural Sciences. Again, someone had not been accepted, but he was enrolled. He studied for six months and failed again in the first exams. This time he was expelled for failure. It is not known where the influential dad placed him. Two more such students made it to graduation with threes. One was the daughter of the head of the city council. We called her coward. She terribly learned everything by heart. And if the teacher asked her in practical classes or seminars, then she seized up, turned white with fright and mumbled something without knowing what to do. There was also the son of the head of the Republican administration, so he kept changing suits and had his own tape recorder in those days, which recorded the voices of girls, and started for threes. From the first days, I literally threw myself on the textbooks and spent long evenings over them in the reading room or in my room. I never put off homework until tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. That's why I got only fives and received an increased scholarship. So-called rest evenings often took place at the Institute. Today at the Philological Faculty, tomorrow at the Natural Sciences, and the day after tomorrow at the Foreign Department. And they were vacationers who were on time everywhere. And on the exams, they received threes or took them several times. On Fridays, Johan Hutzel and I attended classes at the Lit Studio, which was traditional at philological faculty. It included about 20 beginners who tried their hand at poetry. Dos and Kosinov led the class. In class, we read and discussed our poems, and then they were placed in a wall literally newspaper. Evgen Hutzel was extremely productive. His poems came out quickly and he wrote a lot of them, but they were rarely published in the press since his poetic lines were mostly relical, intimate or landscape and newspapers needed ideological topics. After the Institute, Evgen Hutzel worked in various newspapers and became a famous Ukrainian writer. More in his student years, or maybe earlier, he showed a poetic nature. He was a kind of weirdo. Wherever he was, at lectures, in the circle of friends, on the city street, words, rhymes, images were always swarming in his head. He lived by them without noticing anything else around him. I remember such a case. It was winter outside, and it was a little cold. It was 11 o'clock at night and he had not come from the reading room. Where did he get lost? Knowing his habit of sometimes observing something to the point of self-oblivion, I went in search. A path through the park led from the dormitory to the institute. I walked and saw as if someone was standing under a lamppost and looking up where snowflakes were circling around the light. I came closer, him. Zhenya, I called, why are you standing here? Huh, what? He looked at me as if he had just woken up. Let's go home, I said, otherwise you'll freeze to death. Yes, let's go, and he obediently followed me. On the second day in his drafts, a poem about a lantern and snowflakes circling in the park at the ball was already ready. And then I can still see like today, he was standing with a girl in the corridor of the Institute. She was saying something to him and he suddenly turned and without saying anything went away. The girl just shrugged her shoulders and obviously thought shit. I was trying to earn at least one ruble for a living. So I wrote, as they say, on the spur of the moment and was often published in Nizhen City and regional newspapers. But I turned away from those poems a long time ago because in them I was forced to hypocritically glorify Lenin and the party, communist humans and so on. Nevertheless, I'm posting several such eulogies on these pages near the monument, line translation from Ukrainian. In gold autumn, an unfading, imperishable monument stands in front of me. The inscription of Vladimir Lenin from the edge solemnly radiates granite. Here the alleys converge. Melody evokes that do not sleep. 
as if the strings in the heart are strange, they bounce, and there is greatness of stormy days through the quiet flow of the melody. In a stormy time over the sea of excited people raised on an armored car by a million hands, that's how he stood. The herald of truth, of judgment, above the kingdom of darkness, chains, torment. His hand was in a rapid, unique takeoff. She took off with the call to a bright goal, showed the way to the destitute planet for which he led the second son, and the world shook. From west to east, a soldier and a worker were going to attack, and he called them in their heart to gain freedom. And his vision penetrated through the distance of ages. There were new and new buildings right there, built by powerful shoulders to constellations, and the field of lullabies rolls ways with a bountiful harvest of golden wheat. I stand in salt, and nearby there are silent friends. The oaks rustle, the dreamy blue sky turns blue, and the whole land, as far as the eye can see, flourishes in bloom and calls to live and live. Here is a line, he took off a call to a bright girl. This poem was published in, a regional news, in the regional newspapers of Chernigiv and Poltava, as well as in the Nizhen city and Lohvitsky district newspapers, and brought me almost a two months scholarship. Glory be to you, motherland. Line translation again from Ukrainian. Oh, how bright it is. Our sun is red. It decorates the earth with rays of gold. The villages and merry cities greet motherland, the young strands. From buildings, factories, and the languages of nations, a joyful greeting rushes on the winds of a song. Glory to the motherland, brother-like, united, whose gardens have been blooming for 38 years. And they ring, ring, lovely views in the generals pouring of sun and heat. Glory to the motherland sheds into blueness about your great deeds party. Hey, Soviet territory, sunny daydream, inexhaustible forces, immeasurable ascent, glory be to you, motherland, brother-like, united, ring with songs for a hundred thousand years. And this poem was on the pages of the same newspapers. In addition to amateur composers, sent me sheets with music, and the poem became a song that I had performed by the choir of the Nisian Medical School, Deineka's Music. Under the banner of Leninist ideas, line translation from Ukrainian. My motherland, clear-headed, you are a bright day in communism. You swim violently, magnificently under the banner of Leninist ideas. The windy sails are waving, darkness is dying behind the line of sight. Fames covered the steadfast and courageous near the nearing steering wheel. Closer, closer in the light. Clear shore goes, a rainbow blooms over the course, and a sea of sun is all around. And so many times black avalanches have rushed in a wild, angry storm into your unfading face. And they threw lead shower, but you, like a rising star, used to float and shine through the night and proudly fly on the rails. The crimson flag is on the call of the commune is the call of the commune. Swim, motherland, in the bloom of strength, in the beauty of labor and struggle. May the sky be blue above you. Pigeons guard the world. For some reason, this poem did not go beyond the district newspapers. One employee from a regional newspaper said that my motherland floats, but it dares and is being built. Well, it depends. Harvest song, the translation from Ukrainian line translation. Hey, rye wheat fields are eared, and above them fragrant soul spills. They are eared to ripening, bountiful harvest. The field rolls right like the sea, the waves are yellow. The collective farm region is getting younger, free and rich. It's nice to live and work, to work, to approach bright and majestic, golden, radiant communist day. Way with corn eyes, native earth, a bountiful harvest, fly, light winged song over the Soviet land. Mikhailov wrote the music for this poem 
I have the notes. I had this song performed by amateur groups in Kivertsi. Of course, I wrote not only ideological poems, labor poems, but also those that sometimes burst out on my chest and were put on paper at the call of my heart. Two sons and a wife remained at home. And for them, I wrote such poems as a birch tree, a gift, a riddle, a magpie, a birch tree, the snow whirled around. It snuggled up with my eyelashes, laid on the collar with silver beads. It formed a white blanket around. A birch tree bends in the garden. I will not take my eyes off it. It all dressed in white. So much reminds me of someone. Excitement in my chest increases. Is it snow or a kiss on the lips? And there's such warmth in my soul although there was no one around. A gift. I will go to the park to the noise of November, where there's a pattern of colors in, the, in Alice. I'll find the best leaf for you to remember and send it to you as a gift from the palette. I collected a leaf after a leaf and was afraid I might offend you. To avoid any possible grief, I'll send all the leaves, not a few. A magpie. A magpie boasted of being very tall. It was looked at, there was just a tail. A riddle, a light translation from Ukrainian. On the high blue hill, yellow sheep scattered. Near them is a horned shepherd, cool-faced and snub-nosed. It's a valid. It comes and looks at the ground. At dawn, he will drive the whole flock into the barn. In those days, painting lips, exposing some parts of the body and fleshy hairstyles were considered immodest, immoral and condemned in every way. I also responded to this topic. Crazy makeup. Don't dye your crimson lips, girl. Don't dye your crimson lips, girl. Don't dye your eyes in blue, your cornflower eyes. Why do you need all this nonsense, young girl? For what charm, for what miracle? You are like the morning star, even without that makeup. Like a flower in the first grass in spring. Don't look for love via fake charms, because you'll be devastated by premature quarrels, and only bitter poison will remain in the heart. From the temptation and from that miracle, please don't dye your crimson lips. Don't dye your eyes in blue, your cornflower eyes. The poem was printed in the Nizhen newspaper and set to music. In the concert program, it was performed with a guitar. Would I have been destined to become a poet if I had started at the Institute permanently and not transferred after the second year to the correspondence department? Maybe no. A poet is born. You can study to become an agronomist, engineer or doctor. And you have to be born a poet, and then you have to work on the word all life. A poet is a fanatic. He is both the master of the word and his slave until death. Only that slavery is voluntary. It is not only exhausting, but also sweet, like vodka or a drug for some. And I just got into life's troubles early. And in such a way out, I threw myself into politics, then onto the stage, then into poetry. I consider myself only a graphomanic who has mastered the technique of poetry, but cannot say anything new. And a poet, according to Lina Kostenka, is always unique, some kind of immortal touch to the soul. You should not write poems when you want to earn a piece of bread but only when you cannot help writing, because everything inside you is hurting, screaming and looking for a way out. The war and the injustice that the Stalinist repressive machine had thrown at me like a stranglehold hurt me, but I didn't write about it. Obviously, I was wary of playing with fire. I was afraid of falling from moral captivity to a more severe, prison captivity.